Yes, this is five tips to help you be more effective in court. So let's get right to it. We're going to go to uh, first thing you want to do. You want to adamantly challenge the prosecution's claims against you. I know this seems pretty basic, but those who have experienced the legal system know that it is a very intimidating process. And out of fear, uh, a lot of times people say, well, yeah, this is a decent defense and I really should challenge this, but I don't want to piss them off. You have to do that. Take the risk. You got to be professional. You got to make your objections. You have to adamantly challenge every one of the prosecution's claims. Uh, okay, so uh, that seems pretty basic, but I tell you, uh, you got to remember, prosecutors are not your friends. They're going to be making all sorts of claims. They're going to be making uh, accusations against you. They may or may not have evidence of it. As we'll get into, they usually don't have evidence of the foundational claim of jurisdiction. Uh, but uh, let's get to number two. This also seems pretty basic, but you'd be surprised at how many people let this go. Again, they don't want to piss off the judge or the prosecutor by raising an issue that the prosecutor is required to prove, but may not have the evidence, and they, they're not going to raise it and make the objection, make the challenge, because it may piss off the uh, the prosecutor and judge. So, I, I you know, we don't want to extend the prosecution any sacred cows. Make them do their job. It doesn't matter how simple or how obvious you think the, uh, the you know, the claim is, uh, that it, 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 the truthfulness of it. Make the prosecutor do their job. Always focus on the prosecutor's burden of proof. You don't have a burden of proof. We don't have the burden of proof. The basic principle of logic that the uh, the burden is on the accuser is in full force here. The burden is on the accuser. And even though in a civil context it's, it's by a preponderance of evidence, they still have a burden. If they don't have the evidence, you don't have to present counter evidence. And the issue of jurisdiction never shifts to the defendant or the respondent. That is always 100% of the time on the plaintiff. So uh, we don't want to give them a free pass. They'll use certain tactics like gaslighting. If you ask them a question regarding something that seems obvious, what are you crazy? What do you don't don't be fooled by this? Don't be intimidated by it. Just say, look, you just take it as par for the course. They're lawyers. They're trying to get a conviction at all costs. They don't give a damn. It's why prosecutorial misconduct, as I've said a thousand times, is at epidemic levels because. And that is prosecutors arguing without evidence and withholding evidence that shows that you're innocent. So these prosecutors are not your friend. They are looking to prosecute you at all costs. An epidemic uh, of prosecutorial misconduct bears that out. So uh, sometimes with trick with tip number three, that's usually all we need to do to at least get enough leverage on the prosecution to show to bring out that they don't have any evidence to get either a smoking deal or have them withdraw their charge. The third tip is always ask leading questions. You should not be making statements because statements tend to take the burden of proof or the focus off of the prosecutor. The whole time we should be beating the same drum, the prosecution's evidence. Where is the evidence to prove that they, their claims are, are true? And it is an ethical violation for a prosecutor or any attorney to argue without evidence. And if you or I argue without evidence, we can not only be charged with contempt and fine, we could be put in jail for contempt. It's a very serious thing. But prosecutors tend to get, again, <laughs> prosecutorial misconduct is at epidemic levels, according to federal judges. So we want to ask just leading questions. We want to object if we're in court during a trial or a hearing, or if we're not, we want to still... Uh, uh, ask our leading question, clarifying questions. This is part of the Socratic method I talk so much about. Uh, remember, we don't have the burden of proof. That lies with the accuser, the cop, meaning the cop or the prosecutor, not the judge. The judge doesn't have a burden of proof. He's just there to ensure that the burden of proof is being met. So uh, we never want to allow the focus to be taken off the prosecutor's claims when we ask leading questions regarding the claims that he's making. So by leading questions, the information is in the question. It's yes or no only. This is especially important when you're cross-examining a police officer or a tax agent. You want to make sure you're asking leading questions. Yes, there'll be some people that'll turn around and they'll make objections or they'll say, oh, it's an argument. No, you can make an argumentative question, but a leading question has the information you're trying to elicit. So another part of this is that it makes it easier for us to get into the lion's den when we're actually in court or talking with the prosecutor or pretrial conference. It makes it easier for us to know that we're getting a responsive answer, which is our the, the next tip. So being that it's just yes or no, you know right away, if you're starting to get a narrative, make your objection, move to strike, and you can say objection, narrative. 
uh, not permitted on, on a cross-examination. Now, uh, it's not even, not even permitted on a direct examination, so you want to keep that in mind also. But fourth, very important, my gosh, I can't tell you how important this is. Most people get derailed when they're in court because they accept a non-responsive answer. Uh, especially true is that not only is it non-responsive, but the judge or prosecutor, especially the judge, will put forth another question instead of just answering your question. So only accepting a responsive answer keeps the cross-examination or keeps the, the uh, discussion on point, which of course is on the prosecutor's evidence, the, the prosecution's bird of proof that they're supposed to prove their claim. Again, prosecutorial misconduct is arguing without evidence. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so uh, what usually will happen when we're asking a leading question on cross-examination is the prosecution will make a really off-point objection, basically lying about the question that you're asking just so that the witness is protected and doesn't have to answer the question, such as asking the police officer for the evidence, the facts he relied on to, uh, uh, that he relied on to form his belief his opinion that there was jurisdiction to stop you. So you'll get an off-point objection, and the judge will just, uh, without any explanation, without any argument from you, it doesn't matter that, that you, you know, you're only asking for the facts. They will sustain the objection, and that is a denial of cross-examination, which, of course, is supposed to be one of the worst errors a judge can commit. And at that point, realize, to, and I'm just trying to be brief in this video, uh, you're asking good leading questions. You're getting a denial of cross-examination. You, if you, you know, that, that's look, there's no point in continuing because the judge has proven he can't be fair. He has already determined well in advance you're guilty, and that's why he's stepping all over your cross examination. Instead of saying to the prosecution that uh, it was an off point objection and that he'll be sanctioned if he continues, no, he goes and accepts it anyway. So, I, what I would recommend is definitely take a look at some Kelly Conway videos, who's a spokesman for uh, President Trump, and really any politician, but she is one of the worst. So she's such a glaring example. So you understand when you when someone is dodging a question. Just real quick, I could ask uh, a police officer, did you determine you had uh, jurisdiction over me? And the cop will say yes. And then I can ask, well, what facts did you rely on to establish you had jurisdiction over me or to support your opinion that you had jurisdiction over me? And the prosecutor will say, objection calls for legal conclusion. That's not on point. He should be sanctioned. He or, she, he or she should be sanctioned. Instead, they're rewarded. So you know that the judge is in collusion with the prosecutor. He's definitely acting in concert with him to den or her to deny you a fair trial. Now, fifth, this this is this is uh, also a big one. All five of these are going to really help. You'll be immediately more effective in court. You should be anyway. Uh, but you do need to work on this and do role playing, which I'll discuss in a moment. Uh, you have to assume that every single word coming out of the prosecutor, the cop, and the, and the judge's mouth, every single thing that they are saying is a lie. Now, that doesn't mean that everything they say is a lie. All it means is that you're going to challenge it and make them prove it. Don't make this easy for them. In fact, it, you know, it actually works into our benefit. If we can make the prosecution for, uh, of us so difficult that they just throw the towel and withdraw, great. You've just saved yourself time, money, and energy uh, uh, by going and not having to go through a trial, which they don't want to anyway. So uh, you want to object and challenge them on every single thing that they're saying. So a common thing that they like to say, this is an example of cherry picking. You'll go in to challenge jurisdiction, which is exactly what they'll do if you sue them. And the judge will cherry pick. Cherry pick is when you, when you deliberately leave information out that's necessary. You leave some context out. So that somebody, it sounds like you're saying something that's true. So they'll try to good cop you and say, oh, well, you can challenge jurisdiction, sir, but not now. Uh, that's a trial issue only. See, they don't necessarily say only, but they leave that word out. But the fact that they're saying you, you can only challenge it at trial and not at an arraignment or even pretrial, that's an example of cherry picking. You very well can challenge jurisdiction. The moment someone is asserting jurisdiction over you, you have the right and obligation to defend yourself and see the evidence that that is based on. And an example I give on the show, if you doubt this, sue them. 
Sue a judge or a prosecutor. There's no way in the world that they're going to have to argue that there's no jurisdiction because of sovereign immunity or, okay, uh, or absolute immunity and have to do that at trial. You won't even get past, past the pleading stage and you shouldn't. Because jurisdiction challenged must be proven. So uh, that that's one of the many, many, many lies that judges will say. Jurisdiction is not just a trial issue. Another one is that jurisdiction is a pure issue of law requiring no evidence. This is absolutely not true. So a direct quote from a, from a state judge in New Hampshire is, jurisdiction is a pure issue of law requiring no evidence to establish it's true. Or uh, Okay, uh, uh, all the prosecution has to do is show that you're physically in New Hampshire. Well, phys being physically in New Hampshire is not a matter of law. That is a matter of fact, which is why they will lie and say jurisdiction is a trial issue only. So uh, that keep that in mind. You're going to challenge everything. Everything they say is a lie. Because, but not that it is, but it's a tactic. So that you will you will not let anything go and allow them to say something that could really help towards denying you a fair trial, which is what you're trying to do. If, if, if there's any amount of fairness to these traffic courts and possession charges and tax cases, they will throw it out almost immediately. So I do have a comprehensive model on how to effectively deal with bureaucrats and, and how to argue in, in the book, of course, Government Indicted. But I do want to say very briefly, and I'll end this video on that. Uh, you can get more information, of course, at markstevens.net and listen to the broadcast of No State Project. Uh, you do have to work at this. This is not a simple fix. I do have motions, motion templates available to challenge jurisdiction, but this takes some work. I'm not saying that you have to dedicate your life, but you're going to have to put some hours in, and you're going to have to do some role-playing, and you'll see that you will be a lot more effective in court. And we have been able to replicate my success and other people's success from Adventures in Legal Land era uh, on three continents, including Israel. So, and that's all up at markstevens.net. And my name is Mark Stevens. Uh, you can get more information at uh, markstevens.net. And these five tips will help you be more effective in court.